Director of Theology and the Arts here at United. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Flesh in Uncertain Times, which is the culminating event of this year's Arts Praxis course. And I say this every time because it's true, this course is my favorite class to teach at United. I am always amazed by our students and their investment and vulnerability and their creativity, the way that they create incredible, compassionate culture in their classroom space. And I learned so much from them and from our very organic, messy process. I wouldn't have it any other way. So in this course, in the Arts Praxis course, our students develop projects around key theological and spiritual questions in a medium of their choosing. The works that you've encountered out in the gallery and we'll hear about tonight uh, reflect the work not just of this term, but also the influence and conversations of countless courses and experiences from the last several years. The title, Flesh in Uncertain Times, was selected by the students themselves and reflect common themes that weave throughout the exhibit, such as embodiment, fleshiness, narrative, the sacred, and apocalypse. <laughs> so on behalf of the Praxis cohort, I'd like to thank the guest artists who visited our class this term and spoke about their work. Corey Steckelberg, Noam Siena, Isabel Nelson, Aaron Sharkey, Queen Drea, and Ken Steinbach. Thank you also to Diane Riggs, MJ Luna, and Michael Mua, and President Molly Marshall, who have supported the, supported the planning of this evening's event. In terms of logistics, I'm going to be introducing each of our artists individually before they speak, and we will save all of our questions and conversation for the end, as I think you'll find a lot of really generative uh, connections across them. For the sake of time, this isn't really true, but for the sake of time, <laughs> I won't read the full bios of each artist. I will refer you to the programs that you uh, have printed, and I will try to keep my comments short. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jacques Miller. Uh, the class unanimously proposed that Jacques go first. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that you need to know. Uh, and as you'll see uh, momentarily, it's because they are a presence. When Jacques around, you will find your posture changing, your eyes widening, your whole face smiling, your hands and your arms start to gesture. <laughs> or at least that's what happens to me. I don't know about everybody else. In short, Jacques enlivens our community. That Jacques would step out of their comfort zone for this practicum is not entirely surprising, given their characteristic curiosity and love of process. Still, it's been inspiring to witness their persistence and innovation during this term. But even more, beyond our term, over the past couple of years, Jacques has developed their own theological voice, drawing on their experiences as a performing artist to explore the big questions that motivate them. What does it mean to be human? What's the relationship between humans and the environment? And technology, AI, outer space, but in a really fun way. So, shock. Thank you all, and hello. <clears throat> It's midnight. The engines begin to roar. I am not a robot, he pleads. My soul is not created from AI. I was made from the earth you left me, by the same God who brought you here and is allowing you to leave. Please, don't go. There is a theoretical method used to visualize the chronology of the universe called the cosmic calendar. This visual tool places the beginning of the known universe on the first second of January 1st. The formation of the Milky Way happens in May and our solar system comes together in September. The evolution of the modern human is complete by December 31st at 11.52 p.m. 
The whole narrative of the universe is sequentially placed within the fathomable frame of one year. This method is not perfect. It greatly minimizes 13.2 billion years of history into a clean one-page breakdown, which means it must be leaving out a great bit of detail. However, what this visual succeeds at is its clear illustration of the insignificant amount of time humans have been a part of the universe. According to the cosmic calendar, the last 437.5 years occur within the last half second of December 31st. Cosmically, right now, it is New Year's Eve at 11.59 p.m. with a half of a second left to go. What is going to happen at the stroke of midnight? In the last few years alone, solar years, that is, the years our society recognizes as an actual year, we have witnessed only a fraction of activities that humans have been a part of in this exciting tale of humanity's existence. We have seen the effects of a virus spread over the globe, break down our societal norms, and require us to adapt as compassionately and as informedly as possible. And we have witnessed the virus get worse when we failed to do that. Through this, we have seen the wonders of medicine at work in the creation of accessible vaccinations that would slow down the spread of the deadly virus. Yet, we watched the healthcare systems crumble while workers tried to save the lives of people who chose not to vaccinate. In the last few years, we have watched the fantasies of space travel become exponentially more real, but only in the hands of corporate billionaires hoping to show off their new toys and to dream of colonizing new worlds. We have watched artists win amazing awards and stun audiences, only to later discover they used artificial intelligence or AI to test whether the AI technologies could create a winning art piece. We have long known that there are islands of floating trash that exist in multiple corners of the Earth's oceans. But more recently, we are learning that some of the foods we eat from those oceans leave little bits of material in our bellies called microplastics. And one more frightening fact. We are watching as some police departments in large cities hear the cries for police reformation and answer those pleas by instating the use of police robot dogs. What is going to happen at the stroke of midnight? I'm hoping to be in bed by then. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I'm guessing something strange will happen, something horrifying but potentially something absolutely beautiful. I do not use these above examples lightly. Science and technology, as miraculous as they both are, as much as they seem to fix our problems, can cause undeniable harm if placed only in the hands of the rich and powerful. If cops and Elon Musk have robot dogs and rockets, but class hierarchies and racism keep the most vulnerable people in our city struggling, we have a problem. It is not a poor problem. It is a robot dog and rocket problem. It is a billionaire and police state problem. It is not an ocean problem that we have large masses of plastics floating around them. It's a pollution problem. It is not an AI problem that people can use it to falsify the work they do and the work they don't do, it's an ethics problem. Just like it was never a vaccine problem, but for the most part, a problem of compassion. None of these examples are mysterious or unexplainable. In fact, they are all human problems. I am certainly not anti-science or anti-technology. I'm not even anti-robot or rocket. In fact, I love robots and rockets. What I am concerned about and what my project I'm not a robot stems from 
are the unknown implications of being led by technologies that few of us have access to or knowledge about. I wonder how non-scientists, non-billionaires, get to have a say in the current predicament of our growing marriage to technological advancement. Are there ways that theologians and artists can not only have an opinion, but be active negotiators with the unfolding impacts technology has on our descendants? Octavia Butler conducts a practice of envisioning a future after society as we know it has completely transformed. Donna Haraway imagines possible realities we might live in after each techno-convulsion of late capitalism. Both of these authors help us articulate horrific realities as well as the glorious discoveries of living in a time that is still, to us, a complete and utter mystery. Science fiction authors have a voice in the construction of our future because they share stories that force us to question our current involvement in which futures get to unfold. Some transhumanist artists use the human body as their canvas to imagine ways technology might help us adapt to the changing environments we inhabit. The word transhumanism describes the conceptual ability for humans to control their evolution through biological engineering and technological implementation. There are countless ways technology has assisted us and humans and our experience throughout our history, but transhumanism specifically refers to the cascading effects that biotechnology has on our ability to extend our survival and design our own evolution. One transhumanist artist is Aji Haynes. She created a gallery of human infants with surgically adapted organs, giving the viewers the perspective of future parents shopping for the kind of biotechnological design they would want their baby to have in order to survive global warming. The questions she poses center around what will be socially acceptable once humans have the choice in how their biology functions. Her point is not that transhumanism is wrong, but rather that the complexities of it require us to have a vision of the possibilities of human technological progress and to understand what futures are probable so we can choose what futures we prefer. If there was a techno organ we could create and implant into our intestines to metabolize the microplastics in our bodies, perhaps then we would not need to be so urgently proactive in deciding what to do with the floating islands of waste in our great oceans. Or perhaps the idea of an added plastic metabolizing organ is so absurd that we discover we should absolutely be urgently proactive in our pollution problem. <laughs> These science fiction authors and transhumanist artists are only a few examples of how non-scientists and non-billionaires can offer their perspective on the future of us, the future of humanity. There is a powerful relationship an artist has with the future by painting a picture of both the horrors and the wonders our paths can lead us down. But looking to our past can also help paint pictures of our futures. In Astrotopia, the dangerous religion of the corporate space race, Mary Jane Rubinstein gives this fun fact about some of our most technologically advanced feats into outer space. And I quote, The six Apollo emissions left the surface of the moon littered with a total of 96 bags of human waste. Urine, feces, vomit, and bits of food. They did it to offset the weight of the lunar rocks they were bringing home. They did it because they thought the solar radiation would sanitize the 96 bags of waste." End quote. It is sadly not shocking that people, especially from the United States of America, would travel to a new place and leave with special objects while leaving behind their garbage. Fast forward to now. There is a ring of junk satellites, spacecraft trash, and astronaut excrement that orbits our planet. So much stuff. So much shit. 
so many past technological advancements sitting on and around this sad little planet. Midnight approaches, and here we are, sitting on our own piles of trash and excrement, while our trash and excrement also float around our planet. Not to mention the microplastics, the descendants of our garbage, which have discovered ways to transcend our interiors. Technology can be magnificent. Plastics can be helpful. But by filling our world with more and more useful stuff, we have turned the Garden of Eden into a plot of dried dirt. Mother Earth is transforming into a landfill. Our bodies are consuming the plastics we had hoped to disregard. And we are desperately searching for more and more places to put our trash. Enter stage right, the sad little creature that claims I am not a robot. He is the emerging descendant of humanity. After filling the lands and our bodies with so much stuff, the biotechnologically advanced humanoids decide to leave planet Earth behind for good. Leaving behind at least one creature, probably with no health care, certainly poor, looking up to the heavens, not searching for God, but searching for the ancestors that abandoned him on a planet of overflow. My project, I Am Not a Robot, is about the implications of technology, plastics, and other synthetic materials coming into contact with our organic selves, whether intentionally or not, and changing the ways our bodies evolve for the better or the worse. My process was entirely experiential, experimental, both. Cutting, breaking, tying, gluing different materials together to find out how the manufactured medium can emulate evolved biological material. I'm curious how humanoid figures can engage viewers simply by being somewhat related to them, and what kind of hopefulness or hopelessness can come out of encountering a creature so like us, yet so different, from a world so unlike our own, yet horrifyingly similar. I was often lost in my process, excited though about each corner I was able to turn and each new discovery I made about the reality of things found in my recycling bin. I have become extremely intimate about what kinds of mold grow in all of our containers. <laughs> it's midnight. The engines begin to roar. I am not a robot, he pleads. My soul is not created from AI. I was made from the earth you left me, by the same God who brought you here and is allowing you to leave. And until the moment the planet is gone forever, your descendants will always know who is responsible for the kind of world you left them. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Grace Riggs. Do you all know about Lydia, the seller of purple? Described in Acts chapter 16. After hearing Paul preach, she and her household were baptized. And then she urged Paul and his company to stay at her home. The scripture concludes, and I quote, and she prevailed upon us. To know Grace Riggs is to be prevailed upon. Amen to that. <laughs> which in my experience has always been a good thing. From our first conversation in which Grace asked, scratch that, informed me that she would paint a mural in the intersection and you can all look behind you to see the beautiful uh, mural that she did in fact paint. It's always been clear what Grace thinks about things, which I find very refreshing. Grace is a visionary, a creative and thoughtful go-getter with an excellent sense of humor, just like me. 
she also has a talent for impressions, uh, and I am sparing you tonight by resisting the urge to impersonate her. It was very, very tempting. Yeah, maybe next time. Uh, Grace has a deep love of the Bible and is a lifelong artist. All of this uniquely equips her to re-engage and reimagine tired or destructive interpretations of the Bible for the Christian community in ways that are life-giving and speak truth to power. In short, her work is, as my esteemed colleague Dr. Wheeler would say, compelling. <laughs> Oh boy, that's what I imagined it was going to be. <laughs> Hi everyone, as Dr. Osterman said, yes, my name is Grace, and I am very excited to be with you all here this evening. My arts practicum is entitled Holy Whores, Witches, and Wenches, and consists of five women from the Bible who I think have been misinterpreted throughout history. This arts practicum was not what I expected it to be as I found out I was pregnant during the first few weeks of the term and I am primarily an oil painter and working in oil paint is not something that is recommended by professionals while you are creating a child. So my process was very disrupted to say the least. Gloves and masks were worn, a fan blew directly in my face, and my balcony door was always opened, which often got chilly since Minnesota spring is more comparable to the Arctic rather than the warm images of spring we see in Easter cards. When I was considering what I wanted to create for this class, I knew I wanted to do something with humans, particularly women, and that I wanted to have fun. I find fun to be at the center point of most of my creations because if I didn't have this to spur me on, I simply would not create. And what is more fun than the bad girls of the Bible? <laughs> a lot of you are thinking a lot of things here, or weird. While being at seminary, I have come to realize that the field of biblical studies and biblical hermeneutics are my favorite things in the world because of how they continually provoke my curiosity. While discussing in class what each of us were considering creating for our arts practicum finals, I made a comment, about, a comment about biblical studies being my one true love, to which Dr. Oz Freeman gave me a look of disappointment. It seemed to be her saying, but Grace, what about art? After this interaction, I was thinking about why I consider biblical studies to be my central interest when I am someone who's been creating art on a very regular basis since I was a small child. I came to the realization that the act of creating has never simply been an interest or hobby for me, but has been central to my core and central to who I am as a person. I believe that all humans were made in the image of God and therefore we were made to create. Hence, everyone everywhere has the capacity to create in some sense, you just gotta find your medium, as Dr. Oz Freeman often reminds us. Nonetheless, for me, art and creation cannot be separated categorically into a hobby or interest because they are part of the very force that drives me forward. Before I dive into these pieces, I'd like to acknowledge that the series has been heavily influenced by two people, one being Gabriella Boros, who came to United last spring to showcase her series of matriarchs from the Hebrew Bible entitled Rage of the Matriarchs, and Dr. Senna, who presented a lecture at United entitled The Real Stories of Bad Girls of the Bible. And I must admit that I did come up with the title of this before I'd picked many of the women to focus on. Throughout Western history, women have often been portrayed as either angels or monsters, meaning they're either gentle, soft, nurturing, etc., etc., or mo monsters, also known as whores, rule breakers, or rebels. Devorah Letterman Danley, who's one biblical scholar, argues that this dichotomous division enhances the male ownership of women and, women and femininity. And sadly, this dualistic understanding of women's experience is not excluded from biblical interpretation. 
The first woman I knew I wanted to focus on was JL, found in Judges chapters four and five, because of how clearly she floats between these two categories. And although she is not technically a whore, wench, or witch, I believe her story fits in my theme because of the way she's often misunderstood by our patriarchal world. Jael's story is often viewed as one that showcases Yahweh's power to save Israel through using Jael to kill Israelites' enemies, military leader. Scholars are in debate regarding whether or not Jael had any sort of sexual interaction with Sierra, the military leader, and whether or not this potential sexual interaction was consensual prior to her driving a tent peg through his skull to ultimately end his life and oppression over the Israelites. This interaction is one of both violence and horror, capturing the angel, angel and monster personas. When portraying her, I wanted to shed light on the terror and fear and trauma that she had to go through in order to save um, a people, and potentially herself. I have never murdered anyone, but I am sure the experience is not pleasant. <laughs> Jael is often viewed as a war hero, a victor, and even as a God-ordained seductress. Although these titles are not necessarily wrong, I don't think they highlight the experience of her humanity. This painting is not supposed to make you feel comfortable, it's supposed to make you feel her humanity and terror. The next painting I created was of the woman caught in adultery, and although this is her official title, I found myself repeatedly referring to her as the woman who was almost stoned. I believe this is because of my bias to reject the notion of her simply being a monster character. Ever since I was a child, the story has always been my favorite Bible story. I think it's because of Jesus' ability to point out the hypocrisy of the religious elites and all the people who are eagerly ready to kill the women for her mistakes while simultaneously being gracious and kind. This painting also aims for you to see her humanity in her fear that death, her death may be around the corner. The third painting I created was of Rahab, who has historically been understood as a prostitute. She saved her family from the destruction of war in exchange for hiding two Israelite spies. Rahab lets down a red cord, which is a symbol of Yahweh's favor throughout the Hebrew Bible, to, signi to signify that she must be saved while the rest of her city crumbles to pieces. Rahab has often been hypersexualized due to her name in Hebrew being linked to the meaning of broadness, which has been interpreted as referring to her work as a prostitute or potentially her genitalia. Yet, many scholars argue that the meaning of her name more accurately represents Yahweh's inclination towards liberating the Israelites into locational broadness and prosperity of the Promised Land. Therefore, Rahab is not simply a whore who decided to side with Israel, but instead is a symbol of liberation for those in relationship with Yahweh. The next woman I wanted, I painted, arguably has one of the worst reputations in the Bible and throughout our culture as a whole. Whole, whole. Jezebel was a Phoenician princess married to the Israelite king Ahab. She was initially a political pawn used to secure Phoenicia's protection for Israel, yet became a symbol of rebellion against Yahweh and Israel and more, in more recently history symbolizes monstrous women everywhere. Second Kings chapter 9 verse 30 says that when Jezebel heard the king was in her homeland, she quote, put on makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out the window. In this painting, I wanted to il illustrate Jezebel getting herself ready before she knew what her future would hold and how her lasting identity would affect culture for thousands of years to come. My final painting is of the Witch of Endor. To say it like that. Uh, the Bible surprisingly casts this character in a very neutral light, despite the rest of the Hebrew Bible being seemingly very anti witchcraft. In the book of Samuel, King Saul has just been stripped of his dynasty due to his disobedience. God has stopped answering him, and poor desperate Saul thought it would be a good idea to find a witch who he had actively banished from the kingdom and whose practice he had made illegal to do some dirty work for him and sum up the prophet Samuel from the dead. 
Saul shows up in the middle of the night, disguised with a few other men, and demands the, the witch's assistant, who replies, quote, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and wizards from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? So she's like, seriously, dude? Are you trying to get me killed? I don't know about you, but if several wealthy looking men showed up in the middle of the night demanding I do something, I'd probably do it out of the fear of the consequences of rejecting them. Hence, she calls up Samuel. Samuel and Saul have a little chit chat, and then the witch kindly serves them food. Wow, how wicked of her, am I right? <laughs> When I started this project, I set out to justify the actions of each of these women, some who are often regarded as angels and other as monsters. Yet, after more consideration, I came to the, con the conclusion that their actions, whether we deem as morally right or lacking, denies these women of their humanity and participates in the patriarchal control of their identities. None of us fit into strict categories of monster or angel, good or bad, or even righteous or unrighteous. In Hebrew Bible class, Dr. Senna explains that from many scholars' point of view, righteousness in the Hebrew Bible is not something that can be earned, but is instead a God-given right due to our humanity. I believe this outlook of seeing each other as righteous and seeing each other as made in the image of God allows for the nuance and fragility of our humanity to be more accurately represented. The characters of the Bible reflect our humanity and our perpetual ability to miss the mark. This is arguably why the Bible continues to shape our culture and each of us as individuals. Yet, many of us know how harmful these texts can be when we forget to recognize the humanities of the characters and the authors of all of our sacred texts. I hope my paintings, if anything, invoke a sense of each of these women's humanity and holiness and encourage us to see the humanity in everyone around us. It has been my pleasure to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Meg. <laughs> I don't know where to put the... um, Meg's reputation precedes them. Or at least it did in my case, when I heard about their theological brilliance from multiple colleagues for what felt like years before finally having them in class. And anyone who knows Meg knows that the reality even exceeds the reputation. Meg is ravenous for theology. It's a food pun. Okay. Fun up bunch. Thank you. And what's more, they have a distinct theological voice that beautifully weaves in literary and other cultural sources, a theopoet through and through. I recently had the honor of being the second reader on their MA thesis, which made me even more excited to see where their doctoral studies at the GTU will take them. Um, you know, basically groundbreaking interdisciplinary work in disability theology, eco-theology, theopoetics, pantheism, and interreligious dialogue, to name just a couple of the things that Meg will be engaging. Um, Meg was also my student assistant for art, religion, and contemporary culture this past fall, and it was a total joy to see them in action as an educator. Um, an incredibly creative and generous teacher, which was not a surprise, but really fun to see in action. And I haven't even gotten to their Praxis project yet. Meg is an incredible chef and someone who embodies hospitality in a very authentic way. As you can see, I could go on and on, but I'd better give Meg the chance to represent themselves on their own terms. So, Meg. That was a lot. <laughs> Just gonna share a screen here. And present. There we go. Well, sort of. Good evening. As Dr. AF said, my name is Meg Mercury. 
For my arts practicum, I wrote a cookbook titled Praying Attention, Four Menus in Four Seasons. I love cookbooks. I love the practicality of the directions and the way the author's personalities occasionally seep through the lines of these pragmatic instructions. I love the specialization of culinary language, the frequency of words like whisk and steep <laughs> and broil. I read cookbooks like novels, start to finish. Or I did, until I became a theology student. Then it seemed my reading time was entirely spoken for. By God. <laughs> God and Dr. Demian Wheeler, my advisor. <laughs> When I decided to take the Arts Praxis Seminar, I knew I wanted to take on a creative project that entailed more than just more writing. I wanted to do something with my hands, something tactile and sensory and preferably far away from a computer screen. I also wanted in my own small way to make something that felt meaningful to me, a creative response to how it feels to live in a body in alienating and, yes, uncertain times over a Boxing Day lunch with my friend Jacques. The idea for a theological cookbook was born. Over the past four months, I conjured themes, imagined menus, crafted recipes, tested and adjusted those recipes, and organized dinner parties to serve those menus to daring guests with whom I could also discuss the core ideas around which the menus are designed. During this time, I also collaborated with an incredible photographer Brandon Wirth, who is here this evening. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Preparing my recipes, which he took the beautiful pho photographs you see in the book and in this presentation. The month of March was a chaos of dinner parties, photo shoots, recipe testing, and thesis writing. But the result is this cookbook. It probably seems incongruous to write a book like this. What do cookbooks and theology have to do with one another? Why are the menus organized around moods? What do the seasons have to do with anything? In my view, a cookbook is a perfect place to do a little theological thinking because the culinary arts involve three core components of my own theological outlook. Affect, attention, and appetite. Affect is kind of a fancy word for feeling. The father of modern liberal theology, Friedrich Schleiermacher, recognized that all religions are culturally constituted. Beliefs are constructed things. They don't spring up from nowhere. So, he reasoned, belief itself can't be the foundation of authentic spiritual experience. Schleiermacher posited that the true foundation of religious experience is feeling, the feeling of interconnection. In his On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers, a title I will never top, Schleiermacher made a good faith effort to persuade those who were throwing the baby of authentic spiritual experience out with the dirty bathwater of religious corruption. The church teaching some falsehoods does not render all spiritual experience inauthentic, he argued. To his interlocutors, he pleaded that they consider again those feelings that came before all the dogmas, rituals, hierarchies, and cultural biases had been appended to them. The very pre-verbal nature of affect was, in short, what rendered feeling a vital source of authentic spiritual experience. Sounding like someone who spends plenty of time in front of an oven, Schleiermacher wrote, you must transport yourselves into the interior of a pious soul and seek to understand its inspiration. In the very act, you must understand the production of light and heat in a soul surrendered to the universe. And again, with culinary flair, he later describes true religion as sense and taste for the infinite. Thus, with the birth of liberal theology, we also had the birth of affect theology, theology that takes seriously the role of feeling in our dealings with the holy. I would submit that in addition to Herr Schleiermacher's arguments, there is another reason to take feelings seriously when we go about our theologizing. That reason is that we are moody creatures. 
And to pretend otherwise is to let those moods slip in the back door of our theologies, unacknowledged and wreaking havoc in potentially dangerous ways. I find it far better much like our biases, cultural locations, and other presuppositions, to usher them in the front door and in full daylight, where we can query them and confront them honestly. Yes, I experience the divine through feeling, but I also have feelings about the divine. Confronting those feelings with honesty should be part of my work as a theologian. In fact, I think it is a necessary part of our work as people who strive to be in spiritual integrity, full stop. Of course, to be honest about our moods, we must pay attention to them. My therapist is constantly asking me to stop intellectualizing my moods and directing me instead to pay attention to them, to their physicality, their embodiment, their immediacy and feeling. Attention, Simone Weil writes in Attention and Will, you scooped me, Pacman. Uh, taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. It presupposes faith and love. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. Extreme attention is what constitutes the creative faculty in man, and the only extreme attention is religious. Sally McFaig, the great eco-theologian, echoes Faye later in her book, The Body of God, when she talks about attention epistemology, essentially claiming that the only way we can come to know anything at all about the divine is through paying close attention to the natural world around us. Cooking, for me, is a realm where these acts of prayerful attention come together. Cooking without close attention is a shortcut to injury and bad food. The number of times I have burnt myself or a meal or a pan or cut myself or misjudged the flavor of something because I was not mentally and emotionally present to the action of cooking and the sensory details the food and its transformation before me were providing me have been lessons in paying extreme attention. When I do, I notice interesting things. Not just the exact moment an omelet is ready to release from a pan, or how to predict the point at which a liquid will move from a simmer to a boil, but how certain aromas carried on steam release deeply held emotions in my body. How warm tomatoes and basil smell like home somehow. How kneading dough creates space for grieving tears. How the scent of nutmeg brings me joy. More broadly, to cook well, I must pay attention not only when I am physically in the kitchen, but when I am selecting ingredients for my meals as well. This requires me to pay close attention to the seasons as they shift, to be aware of nature around me and how its cycles impact the food that is available to me, its freshness and where it comes from and how. This act then of paying deep attention which Vey says is prayerful and religious, and McFaig says is the only way to truly know anything about God, also attunes us to eating well, and to consciousness of our local environment and what is happening in and to it. It makes us aware of ourselves, our moods and appetites, and how those may have positive or negative impacts on the world around us. It makes us aware of the world at large and reminds us of our place in and of nature. But while I believe we need to be mindful of, attentive to, our appetites and conscious of their impacts on our environments, I want to be careful not to condemn them. I think too often we in theological and religious spheres have condemned appetite as gluttony, as lust, as something intrinsically to hold in suspicion. While certainly moderation is a good thing, I do think our appetites deserve another look. They point us toward the good things in life. Those things that bring us nourishment, comfort, and joy. They direct us toward experiences that build community and relationship, and they illuminate what we might be missing and need more of. Nutrients, intimacy, pleasure. Appetites, I believe, can even remind us when we have lost sight of our connection with the holy and direct our footsteps back to our search for it. So, affect, attention, appetite. 
You will find plenty of each of these in the pages of this cookbook. So that you know what else to expect, you will also find that the cookbook is organized into four menus, one for each season of the year, each season assigned one mood around which the menu is designed. Desire, loneliness, wonder, and joy. These menus are, as one friend commented, a little extra. <laughs> they are intended for special occasions. Dinner parties, birthdays, celebrations where a little extra effort is appropriate. Any individual recipe could work for an everyday or perhaps weekend dish, but the menus served together at once are meant for a special affair. In other words, no, I don't cook duck breast with pomegranate and carrot puree for my Tuesday night dinners with three other courses. <laughs> After each menu, you will find the recipes. And following the recipes for that season, you'll find a short reflection on that season's theme. I've learned enough from food blogs on the internet to put the essay after the recipes. <laughs> My hope is that this cookbook brings its readers food for nourishment and food for thought, opportunities for reflection, deep attention, and connection to what each one finds holy. The process of writing it has done so for me. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> All those gorgeous photos. <laughs> also. D. D. Grover. You would think that I'm Dee's agent with the way that I go on and on about what a talented artist she is. <laughs> Seriously, she's so talented. Um, I love sharing Dee's art with everyone that I know. <laughs> she can work in a variety of styles and media, but let me tell you, the thing about incredible comic artists like Dee is that they make it look effortless. I assure you it is not. It comes from hours and hours, years of work and experience and talent, natural talent also, to be sure. Dee is a gifted, creative, and hardworking storyteller. And so I maybe shouldn't have been surprised, although I was very much and pleasantly so, that she would be inspired by medieval manuscripts as a medievalist. Ugh, <laughs> what joy. <laughs> because medieval manuscripts, like comics, bring together word and image. I was honored when Dee accepted my invitation to be the student respondent to my book event on the, Ash or my book on the Ashburn and Pentateuch, which uh, was earlier this year. And as I hope she brought her perspective as uh, a working artist and her good humor as well. It's been such a joy to see Dee's engagement with historical theology at United, which she invigorates with her own artistic spin. And so you should be on the lookout for forthcoming publications eventually on this. And it will make you also interested in historical theology. <laughs> it's an incredible, incredible feat. And then you will be obsessed with her work just like me. So given that her practicum project is on Paul and Apocalypse, it seemed like a fitting way, if ominous, uh, to conclude the presentations this evening. <laughs> so without further ado, Dee. Wow, thank you, Dr. <laughs> um, let me set this up. Um, first, I just want to thank all of you here at United. Um, you have all taught me so much, and being here has really inspired me and given me a newfound love and appreciation for the Bible, um, especially as an artist. And I'm forever grateful, so I just want to make sure I say thank you. Um, <clears throat> my interest in eschatology comes from a very personal place. 
and I am only now beginning to address it directly through my art. It stems from my experience growing up in an evangelical Pentecostal denomination known as the Church of God. Not to be confused with Church of God in Christ, we are Church of God and our headquarters is in Tennessee. Yep. Today, <laughs> thank you. Today, mainstream news outlets are in an uproar about the burning of books across America. As a result, you might think this was new, but I promise you, it has been going on for a long time across the country without fanfare. In Topeka, Kansas, as a child, I remember attending the burning of secular music albums like Kiss and games such as Dungeons and Dragons or the Ouija board. In short, we have always liked to burn things. <laughs> Now, despite our protest against what we deem to be secular music or cinematic entertainment coming from Satan's Hollywood, <laughs> we sure did love movies and music. A lot of effort was made to produce Christian versions of everything we hated in the secular entertainment world. For example, if you wanted to listen to sultry music so that you and your lover whom you were married to, could create a quiet storm, all you had to do was turn on B.B. and C.C. Winans. They created love songs that could serve both your spiritual and bodily needs. We even had our own Christian Madonna, and her name was Amy Grant. <laughs> the same was true for horror films. If you wanted to be terrified, you simply needed to watch something that featured what evangelicals feared the most, which was being left behind after the rapture. <laughs> My first experience with this genre of film was the movie called The Thief in the Night. As a kid, I was terrified of the film because Patty, who was left behind, was constantly <laughs> on the run trying her best not to receive the mark of the beast and also trying not to have her head cut off because she refused to receive the mark of the beast. The film seemed to go on forever. <laughs> this type of creative content had a profound impact on me. While other kids had nightmares about Freddy Krueger, I had nightmares about the rapture. Yet, what was different between fearing Freddy Krueger versus the rapture is that most parents could tell their children that Krueger was not real, while my parents were mandated to tell me that the rapture was very real. And I lived my life for many decades according to that belief. The good news is I no longer have nightmares about the rapture. Um, still, I want to understand, I want to understand why so many hold on to beliefs about a great judgment, end of days, parousia, or the messianic age. So many people believe in these apocalyptic dreams, despite their routine failures. Oftentimes, these dreams are packaged as beautiful nightmares, and I want to figure out ways to reflect that in my art. Although, I would need some financial support and sponsorship in order to do so effectively. Just a hint. Yes, you, you're quite welcome to buy that out there. <laughs> I like to refer to my painting concepts as illuminated timelines. The style of painting that I used here was inspired by two apocalyptic illuminated manuscripts. The first one is the 10th century Morgan Beatus, also known as M644. It is one of many illuminated manuscripts that, is, that was inspired by the commentary of the Apocalypse written by Beatus of Liabana around 776. 
After, failing, uh, or after falling out of circulation for about a century, Beatus's commentary would spring back into view, inspiring illustrated versions of the commentary in the late ninth century. Because, well, the year 1000 was drawing near, so folks were losing their minds over the possible end of the world. Next is the 14th century manuscript called the Cloister's Apocalypse, inspired by a number of popular voices in the 13th century, uh, such as the Italian monk Joachim de Fure. The painting I'm sharing with you today features one of the earliest contributors to the Christian apocalyptic tradition, the great self-appointed Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul provides the most literal vision of what the rapture is expected to be like in his earliest epistle. In my painting, he sits on top of a rock while writing his thoughts to the church. The rock symbolizes the disciple Peter as being under Paul's feet. Why? Well, some of you may be familiar with the fact that Paul, according to himself, had an embattled relationship with Peter and James, James the brother of Christ, which is a subject unto itself. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus proclaims that Peter would be the foundation that the church was built on. But as some scholars would argue, it is Paul who actually lays down the foundation of the church through the might of his pen. Um, next in the painting, you have five columns that represents Paul's most authenticated uh, epistles from left to right, 1 Thessalonians, uh, Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians as one column in the middle, Romans, and finally Philippians. Philemon is the seventh epistle, but its contents uh, did not relate to the subject of the painting, so it was left out. Also not, present is, are, are also not present are the other six epistles which are regarded as inauthentic, such as Colossians, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Hebrews, and 2nd Thessalonians. The height of each column reflects both the length and the intensity of Paul's letters. This can be visually interpreted as Paul's rhetoric increasing in complexity as he tries to explain away the problems with the delayed parousia, or second coming of Christ, while also wrestling with the power of sin and death. Above each column is a scripture that reflects the eschatological journey Paul took over time. As I begin to read closely each of the epistles, uh, what jumped out at me was Paul's fear of death, more specifically his fear of death and his power over the body. Above the first column is an excerpt from 1 Thessalonians 4. Here Paul speaks about death in a cavalier way, describing it simply as sleep. His He's confident that this sleep in the grave will not get in the way of Jesus arriving in the air to receive his believers, changing their bodies so that they might dwell in the heavens with God. Next, we have Galatians chapter 2. When he writes to the Galatian church, his tone changes from confident to defensive. There is much that can be said about the troubles he had with the Galatian church, but Paul wants them ready and looking up to the sky for Christ. He doesn't want them looking down below trying to get circumcised. Also at this point, he begins to talk abstractly about dying. He uses death as a way to relate to Jesus. He describes himself as dying with Christ, and he speaks as if Christ is living through him. Then we have his letters to uh, the Corinthian uh, and the Roman church. Right into the Corinthian church, he is upset that some have started to say there is no resurrection of the dead. Again, death appears to be winning the battle, and Paul must figure out a way to subdue its power. In Romans, he momentarily collapses under the weight of the truth that sin and death still have power. He confesses that he too is having trouble dealing with the desires of the flesh, so he writes, but I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? 
Finally, in Philippians, Paul further alters how death functions. It becomes less of an obstacle and more of a bridge to Jesus. Philippians 1, through 23, he says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet I cannot say which I will choose. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. Church tradition tells us that Paul died through martyrdom, but there is no evidence that this really, that, that really gives us an account of how Paul died. It still remains a mystery, but this we do know. We know that Paul's parousia never happens and he finally experiences death, death without a resurrection. <clears throat> now, <laughs> I don't wanna end on a morbid note. <laughs> um, what can we glean from, what, from Paul's fight with the power of death over the human body? I believe Paul's hatred of the body stemmed from his personal vulnerability to death. And this is a poor way of relating to the frailty of being human. Frankly, the Christian community needs to rethink our relationship with the body. I grew up trained to be suspicious of the body accusing it of purposely sabotaging my relationship with God, either through sin, sickness, or death. There is a hatred of the body that needs to be done away with. And I appreciate that this conversation is going on here at United. I appreciate the moral imagination unfolding with respect to our frail bodies. Let's not overlook that there are so many bodies under attack as we speak. Trans bodies, women's bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, disabled bodies, so many bodies. We need a reformed kerygma that honors the human body along with other bodies on this planet. We need a reformed gospel that honors the biodiversity of this planet and beyond. We need an unrelenting proclamation that will withstand the greatest lies ever told about the body. So let's say plainly that we are all valid. Our bodies are valid. Why? They are valid because they are here. And that's the truth. Thank you. Amen to that. So you can see why it's my favorite class to teach, I think. It's pretty evident. Um, as we invite our artists up here to answer questions, we're going to take a quick five. That's not a united five. It's a, it's not a stand out there. No, no, no. Yeah, you'll be herded back in here. I am the shepherd of this operation. Okay, I'll do it. Yes. Um, because, and there's probably a Jesus analogy to be made here, but there, there is some more uh, Prosecco, Prosecco yeah. that's been retrieved. So you may replenish your glasses here. Five minutes is all you have, and then we're... It's a graduation miracle. It's a graduation miracle. <laughs> we'll call you back. Zoomers, uh, you can get a refreshment, and then we'll be back for Q&A. I'll work on that. We're ready to take some questions. <clears throat> yeah. I'll take care of it. Just sit down. <laughs> sit down. The camera. Yeah. We just need somebody to fix this. I don't know how to I'll fix it. OK. <laughs> We're live for questions. Great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you get it first. Oh, yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> And we really welcome questions, not so much commentary. As we know, that is hard for all people. We know it's hard. Not lengthy stories. I have a question. Thank you, Elena. Hello. Wait for the microphone, please. Okay. Um, 
first off, loved. Sorry, it's a comment, but it's coming. A love, little love, commentary love is all. fine. Um, and working individually on these projects, I know is a lot, but I'm just so curious how being collaborative in the class time impacted your art. I can only speak for me. Hi, everyone. It's Jacques. Um, I think that ooh, um, when you're working so closely on a project for a long period of time, it's really easy to be affected by one another. And the juicy conversations that we have with each other really just kind of, for me at least, I was in the wind. I was being pushed in every direction by every, anyone's ideas, everyone's thoughts, and everyone's um, comments on my process to say like, ah, yes, affirmed, I'm going in the right direction. Um, and so I think that just like kind of committing to being with each other and committing to talking to each other really helps the juices flow and keeps the electricity in our projects like alive and on fire and hot. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's my answer to that. Thanks, Elena. I was just going to say, yeah, some healthy pressure. You have to report back every week, so you got to be working on it or you look like a boo. So. <laughs> um, I'm pretty self pressury, um, but it was wonderful to have people to like come to every week and be able to say like this is where I'm at and does this sound reasonable um, for like the amount of progress I've made and to get the encouragement that this group gave me um, especially because I think of these three as artists and I wasn't really thinking of myself as an artist primarily when I came into this space leaving it I do um, and so maybe that's the gift that these three gave me. So thank you for that. I am inspired by all of them, and I still dream of the possibility of Edie Makes Food. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, just, I know. Um, and also I think the conversations we had in general about quite a few different things, um, especially the, well, the one conversation about AI, I think was fun to have and it was interesting. So I knew every time we checked in, there would be something that I could grab and uh, maybe something I could possibly offer. So it was, it was really nice. I loved everything. I'd like to know what surprised you in this process? What bubbled up that you weren't expecting? Well, I did change things quite a bit. <laughs> you know, I wasn't so much surprised, but it was kind of like a good frustration because, you know, I realized, oh, wait a minute, I can make this, you know, a little more simple. You know, each time it became more and more simple. <laughs> I thought writing the recipes would be easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, oh man, the theology part's gonna be the tough part because I'm like, I've been working so hard at that for the last three years and it is an effort to write theology. And at the end of the day, I was like, I banged that out in like a week at the very end because I had no time left. Um, but writing the recipes was a real um, trial and error process. Uh, I just didn't know how hard it was. I'd never done it before. So I was kind of, shocked and I have a new appreciation for every cookbook I've ever read, so. Um, I think what surprised me is I thought, oh, I'll just paint these paintings and then throw together some words at the end. And then I ended up liking the research part more than the painting part, which is very unlike me, so I, um, that was surprising how much I was like, I actually just like reading these boring articles about words um, from different languages. <laughs> so yeah, that was surprising. Um, great question. I think I have been colored shocked this whole term. Yeah. Um, swimming through a kind of just constant surprise uh, because I wasn't sure what I was doing. 
and I wasn't sure what the vision was. Like only like I had a, like a like a whisper dream of it. So every time I got something a little bit more material put together, or learned that something wasn't going to work out, or learned that like I was just having more fun with it than I really thought I would, then it was just kind of like. <laughs> This is cool. Um, I also was a little bit more shocked as a performer myself, haven't been a super hyper-focused, fixated kind of artist, kind of practical. I'm like, let's get the show on the road. Um, and I found myself like enjoying the just like honing in on like melting plastic and like, ooh, like what, like putting these pieces of, of broken CDs in, in certain places feels like it's important to me. And um, to sort of to, to hyperfixate on that kind of stuff was uh, fun and a surprise. Hey, that was amazing. I'm curious how you see your work. Um, how do you imagine your work impacting your path as it unfolds here or elsewhere? I think, personally, I want to submit, um, I am not a robot to the Minnesota State Fair scarecrow <laughs> thing. Um, so that's kind of like an, 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 a realistic, like, ooh, I think I'm going to try to put something in the State Fair. Um, I also just, I, yeah. I'm serious, go to the State Fair, you'll see it. Um, I also, I just, I've never, I've never worked like this before, and I'm excited to do it more. Um, I'm excited to, to not just have an arts job that is my job, that is like I'm required to in order to pay my rent or my bills, but that I can just like, ah, look it, we got some garbage, maybe I can throw something together. Um, that kind of space was really fun, really freeing, and I can see it really impacting how I work, how I practice in the future. Um. I think for me, my art's always been very separate from my school, and I've kept done that on purpose because I never wanted my art to feel like a job um, or something that I had to do. But I think this project made me realize that there is a place for academic grace and art grace to be in the same place, which is the whole point of United, as we all know. Um, and so I think that has been a cool thing to realize and also just also, again, realizing how much I do love learning about the Bible and how many characters, I think, haven't been talked about. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Bible is losing popularity is because we focus on the same men over and over again when there's actually a lot of different, very um, dynamic characters that a lot of people could relate to and that could... I know I have some cool stories, cool messages. So I'm hoping that my art will, in the future, help to push those other narratives that aren't in the mainstream as much, especially in churches, not just in the theological academic world that is often so separated from churches and communities who are really living into these things. That's freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> I, two things for me. Um, number one, I was simultaneously working on my master's thesis while I did this project. And my thesis was a completely different project before I started this. And it ended up being much more oriented toward the incorporating the arts um, and being interdisciplinary by the time I finished it. So um, I do think that in an, in an inadvertent way, um, working on this pushed me to do that. Um, thanks to you, you, um, and and other people who encouraged me in that direction. Um, and I have the opportunity to continue doing that kind of work in the future, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. Um, but the, I think the other thing that this did for me was, um, I'm never going to write a cookbook again. That was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what I did love actually was um, creating um, opportunities to get together with people to talk about 
theological topics, even if we didn't necessarily end up getting around to them, even saying we were going to sort of um, put them in the room and um, knowing that I'm going to, I'm, I'm starting a PhD in the fall uh, in Berkeley, California, and um, so I'll be in a new community and I wanna be intentional about um, bringing food and theology together probably for the rest of my life. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity to sort of humanize the way that we talk about God and what we find holy, um, and to make that a community effort regardless of what we do or do not have in common. I think it's a way to find commonality. So um, I found that to be a really beautiful part of this project, and I hope that's always something that I can continue to bring forward. Well, I have a church family that I love dearly back home. And um, being here has really uh, boosted my confidence in closely reading the Bible and even critiquing it, you know. And I want to bring that to them, um, you know, kind of like go through the process of becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable with the Bible, you know. Um, in my art, uh, and I got to thank Dr. A.F. for this. Um, I see an opportunity now to really talk about theology and especially those things that are unnerving through the visual art, you know, and um, I'm excited now to be able to create that kind of visual discourse, you know, so, yeah. This is Lisa Besnett. Hi, guys. Um, one of the things that I noticed that was sort of thematic for me across the four pieces was the boldness of them, the richness of the color, the, 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 the depth of, of the, the tone of the, the context, the color, and um, some of the choices that you made. And, you know, I know that bold is not the first place that most of you would step into personally. Uh, and so I'm curious about where, I loved that part of it too. I'm curious about where that came from and how you supported each other into taking those risks and pushing yourself into a more really out there kind of artistic expression. I'm not sure if Dr. Melissa is here at all, but no, but she really gave me uh, the tools I needed to go into Paul. Uh, before her class, I would have never done that. <laughs> um, and there is a certain boldness I've always had, and my mother likes to tell me sometimes she thinks I'm not from this family. <laughs> you know, But she did name me Desire, so I told her it's her fault. But, <laughs> right. Excuse me, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, I'm just excited that that boldness I've been affirmed in while being here, and I want to continue to increase that. No one in the world has ever accused me of being in a lack of intensity before, so I, I think I might need to pass on this one. Um, go ahead. I'll repeat it. No, you're right, Meg. Nobody's ever accused you of lack of intensity. But, but there is, there is a, a boldness in the invitation that is not always present. A lot of your intensity is about you know, where you're at and how you're feeling out, as opposed to a boldness of invitation, which is what mm. your cookbook does. That's fair. Um, I, yeah, okay, yeah, that, I see what you're saying. Um, I feel really comfortable inviting people in. Um, I think Dr. AF said something in her introduction to me, which was very kind, about um, my sense of hospitality. And that is something that feels foundational to who I am as a person. And this project gave me an opportunity to utilize that as an artist. 
um, and as a creator. And that's not something that I always get to do as a theologian, and I would love to find a way to do that. Um, I'm gonna have to put that in my notes app before I leave here tonight, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for the question, actually. that I hadn't thought about that. It's It was about um, being able to be in the space of hospitality rather than just <laughs> as myself, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, my first thought was also like, no one's ever said that anything <laughs> I do is not bold, but um, I think though, usually my art is very pretty. I always create pretty art. Um, but the JL painting was the first painting I've ever made that wasn't pretty. And my husband actually um, is in the STEM field and he sees a lot of blood. So he helped me with the blood. He'd come in and be like, that doesn't look very real. I think you need some more shading right there to make that look a little bit. That's how it looks when it's drying on a body in real life. I'm like, ah. But <laughs> that was an interesting experience. And I, because I was thinking like, how are these women actually, like what's really going on in the story? And there was no way I could do like a hot, sexy jail. Like that just didn't seem real to who, what that story portrays. So I had to do something ugly, which was outside of my comfort zone, but I think it worked out okay. <laughs> um, I just wanna, I wanna cite something that happened last year at this event, the Arts Praxis. And I like asked this question and I was like, I just wanna know like, well, what tips do you have for me when I might have to do this next year? And I don't really know what I'm doing, you know, like what do you, you know? And they were like, oh, I think you already like know the answer. And I was kind of like ticked off. I think it was like <laughs> Isabella that like responded to that. Um, and yeah, and I was just like, <sighs> um, <laughs> And I think that's something that I've learned because I've had the opportunity at United to like have this project that I can just kind of like sink into a little bit more, like sink, like liquidy, kind of absorb into a little bit because you've got the space and the time and like the resources and the support. And so I think that just the, the finding of that sort of visual voice was something very fun for me that I was allowed to do. Um, and yeah, I guess I didn't know that it was gonna be like the boldness and like the blood. I just, me too. I didn't have a husband that is in the STEM um, <laughs> world, but I did look up like a lot of, you know, uh, anatomy pictures online of like where intestines are and like where the pancreas is, just cause I was like. You did to ask where intestines were. Yeah, I did, yeah. And I was just curious about things. And I, and I you know, pictures of those things are like interesting to me and I think, I'm not a scientist or a surgeon or somebody who's like that interested. No, I'm super interested in it, but I, my interest is like adjacent. And so like kind of trying to figure out how to make these nylons, A, like come together, and then B, to get them kind of like bloody and, and bodily was like um, a large section of the last couple of weeks of just exploring and having time to just like, oh, not quite right. Try it again. Try it again with something else. I tried to dye nylon, couldn't do it. Um, how to get different paints, how to like just try different things, put other liquid things on it. And you know, that process of just going, 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 didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, I feel like really helped hone something where then when I looked at it, I was like, could still go more, but I'm gonna choose not to. Like, it's good enough. Um, but you know, I think it, I'm gonna go back to my absorb, my absorb, absorbing into the project, the time and space that one is allowed to, to find something that is right, um, I think is something that this class gives us. Okay, so I'm a staff member, so I will not be in the Praxis next year. But what is your advice for next year's Praxis cohort? <laughs> no, I'm ticked off you asked it again. <laughs> um, okay, here's how you get an A. <laughs> it's past <laughs> um, You know, I haven't talked about God once, so allow me to. I think that there is a deep, trust in a process that may be completely unmaterialized, completely invisible, 
But like to trust in something that isn't there and to trust in the tiny little increments of changes that you find along the way is so like immaculately important. Um, I think that I found a lot, a trust in my own artistic voice, a lifting up of my own artistic voice because I just said, ah, I'm like in a room alone with a bunch of garbage around me and I don't know what I'm doing. Something about this feels right. Something about this is important and I'm not sure what it is yet, but I'm gonna keep going and we're gonna find it together. Me and God. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to follow that up. Um, practically, start earlier than you think you need to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, bringing your art to be kind of, not critiqued, but to have other people see the process of your art every week is not, I didn't love that part of it because I'm very private about my art. I won't even let my husband look at it when I'm in the process because it's embarrassing. So it was hard to do that, but I think mentally preparing and also accepting that it's okay if people see art in that really messy phase is a good thing and it helps it to be better and to be pushed forward because creating is this cycle of like death and resurrection that you're constantly going through and it's messy and there's a lot of grief in that and it's okay for people to see that messy thing. You don't need just to have that perfect product at the end to showcase at an event like this. And I think that's one of the best parts of this class is really that messy part. So prepare for that and it's okay if you feel uncomfortable. Um, just keep going. So yeah, that'd be my advice. This is not contradictory to what Jacques said, even though it might sound like it is. <laughs> but you don't actually have to have a sense of yourself as a capable artist to start this process. You only have to start the process. Right. Um, just wade in to the water and start doing things. And I think that's actually what you, I, exactly what I just said. It was just, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Screw you, Meg, ugh. Um, no, but, but, um, but, which is the opposite of what I did. I went in with like this 12 step plan and I had this whole timeline and then my whole thing fell apart and I, my books literally arrived yesterday and I was hanging things on the wall and going like, oh my God, this is terrible. Um, but truly like, no matter how much of a plan you want to have or no matter how, how much you want to like think that you have it together, it's, it's okay to not have it together, it's better to just walk into the space and know that you will be held because there are people in that space who are being creative with you. And to be honest, if it's being taught by Jennifer Oz Freeman, and it probably will be <laughs> for the as foreseen future. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to... I'm trying to make I'm trying to make AF puns. I'm oh. sorry. Um, <laughs> all right, it's not that late. Um, <laughs> then you know you will be in a container where you are held as an artist, encouraged to grow, spread, and thrive. And so trust that that will be enough. And as long as you show up for it and make the effort, and trust yourself to grow within the effort that you're making, I think that's enough. I have to say, I'm kind of jealous of these three because I'm the Zoom kid. And I got to hang with Jacques last night and work on art projects at the last second, you know? And I was thinking, man, if only I had that all through the trimester, you know? And, uh, but at the end of the day, just piggybacking on off of uh, what Grace had to say. Messiness, I think, is a, a good thing. Because if you have mess, that means you have material. And if you have material, that means that you can take that material and do some magic with it. And the ugly stage, as an illustrator, I've become very comfortable with. If it's not ugly, then it means I'm not trying. <laughs> you know? So, you know, um, 
feeling uncomfortable at a certain point where you're creating something, I think is a very important thing for an artist to, to kind of develop a muscle. It's a muscle you gotta develop, so. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our artists. Uh, maybe you could all join me with a round of applause for our incredible artists. Congratulations, well deserved. Please join us. Um, there are still, I think, maybe some bubbly things, and there's a ton of bubbly things. So please stick around, extend the conversation, look at this incredible exhibit, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Like, um, maybe, um, um, Bobby Darren? 